Today's episode is brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel Greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process, so make sure to check them out. Today's episode is also brought to you by Growers & Co. We are proud to be sponsored by Growers & Co. They specialize in making clothing and tools for growers like us, those who love to grow food, to be outside with our hands in the soil. Their functional wear keeps growers comfortable and resists the wares of everyday hard work. They also publish a magazine twice a year that celebrates growers who are changing the world through small-scale farming. You do what it takes to bring home that harvest, big or small, and Growers & Co. is here to support that important work. Visit growers.co or follow their amazing work on Instagram, at Growers & Co. All right, let's jam. Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, Episode 3, Season 4. So since its inception, the majority of this podcast has been focused on the production side of of regenerative market gardening, right? Uh, We talk about soil, we talk about bed flips, we talk about mulches, and so on. Today, I want to bring in a little more information from the other side of the market garden coin, the side that ensures you as a grower can keep doing all the amazing soil things you do, the business side. We tend to think of the business side as the least interesting side of farming, and no one is more guilty of that than me, but I brought in the one person I felt like consistently made the business side of farming fun for me and interesting and has completely changed how I look at farming, and I know I'm not alone in that, and uh, that's Mr. Richard Wiswall of Kate Farm and author of the classic The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook. It is such a great book. Uh, He's adroit with analogies and brings in a more holistic view of running a business, And we discuss wholesale markets, we talk about cooperatives, we discuss cost of production, uh, how to evaluate a certain practice like deep compost mulching or whatever, for instance, how to evaluate whether or not that is profitable and so much more. If this has been a topic you've been avoiding, here's your chance to break out of that. I loved this chat and there's an enormous amount of value in it. Uh, But first, if you love our content, please consider signing up to be a patron at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Without that support, this podcast and everything else we do would not really exist. There are discounts on merch and events we do in the future and at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Philip Merka, Stephen Smith, Veggie Cropper, Scott Snodgrass, Fiona and Donia Firefly Farm, Jean-Martin Fortier, and Tony Lopez. Huge thanks to everyone who supports our work and enough from me. Let's get into this amazing conversation with Richard Wiswall of Cape Farm and the Organic Farmers Business Handbook. Richard Wiswall, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much, Jesse. Yeah, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's start kind of where we always start with this podcast. Give us an idea of where you're located and how much land you're, is under cultivation there. Sure. Kate Farm is located in central Vermont, right outside Montpelier. And we have 148 acres uh, under management, although there's only 22 acres in cultiva- cultivatable fields. We also have eight 96-foot-long greenhouses where we grow bedding plants, as well as greenhouse greens and greenhouse tomatoes. Yeah, that's great. So, and what's the marketing look like? Like where, where are all the products going? Of the products we grow now, they're mostly local. We have been longtime members of Deep Root Organic Truck Farmers, which is a growers co-op, has been around since 1985, and we're been members of since 1985, where product is grown in Vermont and southern Quebec and shipped to bigger markets in Boston, Connecticut, New York, and even farther south sometimes. And it was started back in 1985 as a way of, so we don't compete against each other in these local markets and tapping these much larger accounts in urban areas and pooling our resources to fill up a truck and buy seed and 
enable us to get into a market which we wouldn't be able to do individually. So I'm a big fan of that model. Um, so we've been doing that for a long time, but that's a part of our business. And we also grow mostly local in central Vermont. You know, we used to go have a truck running up to Burlington, which is maybe an hour away, and but mostly locally and pretty much been a wholesale business primarily from the very start 40 years ago. We went to the, I went to the farmer's market personally for 25 years. We stopped doing that about 10 years ago. We had a thriving CSA in the 90s, and we stopped that for different reasons, which maybe we can get into later. And those are kind of retail outlets. But right now the only retail we do is we have some uh, – we grow – in some of our greenhouses, we grow bedding plants like six packs of broccoli and tomatoes for home gardeners. And we sell those to local gardeners here, and that we're open for weekends uh, in the spring and May to sell directly to the consumers there. But that's pretty much the only time anybody comes out of the farm and buys. And the, everything else is wholesale to local co ops, local stores, local restaurants. You mentioned that one co op. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how that works. Are they. You know, is it something you kind of collectively get together and decide what everybody's growing, or is it something that they commission you, or do you pitch them what you have at that that week by week, or how does that work? Deep Root Co-op has been around since 1985 and has got a very well-evolved um, system of rules and way inter- growers interact. And so that's a very good question and kind of a complicated answer, but generally people that have been growing something for a long time have a little bit of seniority. So if you've been growing beets for, um, say, 2,000 cases a year um, for 10 years, you're going to have, if you know you wanted to join the co-op, Jesse, and say, I want to grow beets, you'll say, well, you're going to have to take the shoulder seasons, you're going to have to wait till the other person's out kind of thing. And so there's primary growers, and then they have a bid system, so you can bid up to the same amount you grew uh, on a two out of three average years to bid for that following year. And all these bids are kind of determined by what the sales manager, which is hired um, by the board of directors. So the Growers Co-op is deep root is a great model and go you can go online to see them or you can um, probably get access to their their marketing system, you know, if you wanted to talk to the board of directors or sales manager. But the idea is um, the sales manager says, okay, we can sell um, 400 cases of red leaf a week in Boston. And, you know, Deep Root is like, you know, $2.5 million in sales. It sends two to three tractor trailer loads of produce from Vermont and southern Quebec into the urban areas. You know, it's a a large quantity, and it allows growers like myself to be kind of on just a – we grow one crop and we sell it. Um, through the co-op, but we could never access those markets like Whole Foods, um, Stop and Shop, all those bigger markets as being a smaller grower. But, you know, when it's filled up with a 48-foot trailer, it works out great. And the co-op, you know, again, I encourage anybody to do it, but to be forewarned, it takes time and effort and have a a communal goal of, of marketing together, which you have to make some sacrifices and you have to um, understand that you might not get the price that you want. But the sales manager basically looks at what things can be grown, say the 400 cases of red leaf a week, and then it gets divvied up between the growers. And the, and the growers, sometimes there's a little bit of negotiating, well, I'll get the red leaf in June, but can I have the romaine in August kind of thing? And, and that kind of happens. And so at the end, we have a, a blueprint of I don't know how many items, maybe 98 or something like that, of different things we sell that we all have a bid on and that we're expected to make that bid So, because all the budget for the co-op is based on what we expect to sell and grow, and we come up with the goods. But the beauty of this is that you don't – well, you farming, like any business, is competitive, and – you know, on a local scale, everybody's growing red leaf in June, and it's a hard sell unless you already have a relationship with the market. But here with Deep Root, you know, your job is to grow the product efficiently and in high quality to have it ready to get shipped to these accounts. And that's all you're focused on. You're not, you know, you're, and again, you're paying for this. You're paying 20% 
upwards of 20% with trucking and um, sales commission to pay for all this, which actually is about what you'd probably pay if you were to go to, if you were to sell to the farmers market or CSA. You don't realize that, but and I need to go into that now. But it's more of marketing costs money, and whether you pay it in one check to the co- growers co-op or if you figure your time at farmers market or setting up a CSA, it still costs you around 20 percent. And that's the cost of doing business. I guess that's all I could say about that. Yeah, that's a, I, I like that because it's something I think is undervalued. And I know we undervalued it on our farm is the amount of time and expenses that go into running and operating, you know, a, a farmer's market. And the co-op thing is really interesting, too, because this is something that I hear from growers who are well established and have been around a while are often involved in co-ops. And we don't talk in the small scale farming world too much about wholesale uh, because it's very much focused on the, the the enormous market that is still growing, it seemingly, of, of direct-to-consumer. But I think that we have, I know that on our farm, we've increasingly started seeing the shoulder seasons as an opportunity to sell more food in a wholesale fashion. But they're, I don't know, I haven't seen that many of these these sort of co-ops in any sort of new way popping up. And I think it's really exciting to see Thing, models like the co-op that you're describing um, is possible, uh, you know, models for those. I think I heard you say that, you know, it's attractive, but most people will saturate their local markets and go for their highest dollar value. So instead of getting 75 cents a head for lettuce by the pallet, you're going to go for the 250 to three dollars a head at the farmers market, and you're going to pay more because you're staffing the market and you're buying tables, chairs, and driving a, a truck and everything else to do it. And you know the market's going to cost you. I mean, if you don't sell a thing, it's going to still cost you five hundred dollars, probably start to finish, to go to a market. And if you're not making five hundred dollars, you're losing money. But that's and you know besides the point. But it's more the you know most people don't want to accept 75 cents a head of lettuce because it seems like, well, I can get $3 somewhere else. But it still pays if you're to, you know, sharpen your pencil and do the math. You, you can make money at a wholesale level, but most people don't get that far because they don't want to take that price point that is much lower than what they could get. It's a challenge, and I think maybe where you are it's different, but here in Vermont, the a lot of the low-hanging fruit had been picked. I'm going to talk pre-pandemic at this point, but you know, before the pandemic, you know, it was a hard sell. If you were just, if you were to move to Vermont and say, I'm going to start a CSA, I'm going to go to farmer's market, you'd be competing with other farmers for the same products for the most part, and you'd probably be taking away business from them. And I'm not, I'm a cooperative minded person and, you know, I want everybody to succeed. I don't want to, I don't want my business to succeed, um, at the expense of yours and drive you out of business or, you know, hurt your sales. And so if all the, if red leaf in June um, is saturated right now, you know, you're, by you growing some red leaf is going to just take away from my sales and another sales and another sales. And that's a, that's a zero sum game in my book. And I, you know, I'm a firm believer, don't step on other toes. And when I go marketing to sell something, I always, try to find a market that's open before doing it instead of saying, oh, I'll just undercut Jesse and sell it for, you know, 10 cents less than he is, and I'll just take it away from him. That's, you know, it's business, but it's cutthroat. And, again, farming is a great way of making a living, and uh, you can make a good living farming, and I think you can do it doing it ethically and treating your neighbors well. And, again, nothing against California and Mexico – I don't mind taking business away from them. <laughs> um, you know, it, uh, they're far away. But, you know, anybody in the state of Vermont or southern Quebec, I don't want to, like, take their business away just because I can undercut or do something devious to get that market share. And, you know, markets are, it, again, it's a competitive business up here. The low-hanging fruit has been taken, so when a new CSA opens, it's more just some CSA members is going from one farm to another as opposed to a brand new customer signing up that happens but not a lot pandemic changed that people really got into local food and it increased the amount of consumers and that marketing pie okay so if you have a 
nine inch pie that is, you know, being cut up into pieces between you and me and three other growers that, um, when a new grower comes in, we just get smaller pieces. But during the pandemic, that pie doubled in size. All of a sudden, there's room for everybody to grow and have other growers come in, and everybody wins. That's great. That's, I don't think, you know, that's not a, that's going to level off, and we're not going to be able to achieve that kind of growth as we did over the last year and a half with the pandemic. Did that change? Did the pandemic change anything about the way that you all were doing marketing or did you kind of just stick with your, your, what you described earlier? Besides just being stressed out 24 hours a day. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, That I think was the biggest thing for me. It's like, so our, the the pandemic hit, you know, in kind of March, but by that time, the um, things are in place and already launched, you know, it's not like I can go back and re you know, just double the amount of seedlings we started or, you know, have enough double the amount of land ready to go because we didn't think that, you know, six months ago. So basically what we found was we sold everything that we had. We sold all our seconds. We sold more efficiently because we had no waste. And the price point, we didn't tend to go, we didn't gouge any, you know, we didn't even raise our prices that much, but sales were strong. We did okay, but again, it was a stressful time just because we ended up having nobody come to the farm to everything online sales, building a website with um, 440 different items, you know, and photos and descriptions. You know, it's a lot of work. And now, two years later, we're not going to do it at all because it is a lot yeah. of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a lot. It's, it's a lot. Um, well, it's interesting. You know, you, you were talking there uh, earlier when we were talking about the co-op and weighing your, you know, wholesale versus marketing, uh, farmer's market and those sorts of things. Um, and I kind of think this is a good way to segue into what, you know, one of the things I I really want to focus this conversation on. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of your book and I think, you know, the organic farmer's business handbook for anyone who doesn't know, I think it's an essential piece of literature sort of for any farmer, any, any business owner, but especially any farmer. Um, but it's also easy to read. And I think you're really great with utilizing analogies and you make it fun and digestible. And I'm kind of, you know, thinking like, you know, often as a community, we are focused sort of on, you know, maybe perhaps disproportionately on soil health and growing practices, but we rarely sort of focus you know, our attention equally on the business side of market gardening. And I'm curious if you'd be willing to kind of make the pitch for caring about the the business side of growing. Well, Jesse, thanks for your kind words about my book. Um, sure, I'd be happy to talk about the business side. And I can understand why everybody wants to get into farming. It's a great way to make a living working outdoors, you know, working with Mother Nature and, you know, kind of the ups and downs of that. And watching food grow is, and, through, and having healthy food for your community, I mean, you can't ask for a better job. But the production side is only one side of the coin, and in the end, you have to be able to produce all that food and still keep money in your pocket at the end of the day. And I've seen all too often, you know, all well-intentioned folks start out you know, with some resources that they had saved up and start a a farm and they, you know, go gung-ho and they work long hours, but they just can't seem to make it work. And then five or seven years later, they call it quits and, you know, use up all their capital reserves. And so they're out of money and they're frustrated and not a great ending of the story. And that's too bad. And not that everybody's going to succeed you know, with their farm that they start. But I think if you know right from the start, you need to look at, you know, basic business practices. That's going to make your farm succeed. And that's going to separate you from everybody else who's not doing so well. And it's not hard, but it does, it's a less glamorous side. You know, I joke that you know, I talk about the most unfun, unglamorous, and the most fiercely avoided topic in farming, you know, looking at the business side. Nobody wants to learn about spreadsheets or balance sheets or profit and loss statements, but you need to know a little bit about that stuff in order for your farm to succeed. And you're going to succeed wildly if you really pay attention to where the money is coming and going. It's crazy. You know, I have colleagues that make 200000 or $500,000 in sales a year, 
and they don't have an idea of where their money's coming and going. And there's partly because of the frenetic pace of farming, especially if you're a diversified vegetable grower, growing 40 different crops all the time during the growing season, you know, juggling 12 balls, and it's hard to do. And one of the last things you're going to do is try to figure out, you know, how much time you're spending growing turnips versus corn versus spinach. But I remember, per, you know, personally, this happened, maybe I was farming 10 years, and I kind of started to know what I was doing production-wise. And it was November, and it was cold. My fingers were freezing. I was washing carrots and sorting carrots outside, and my hair was freezing. I was like, you know, this is, it really isn't worth it. You know, and I, neither, I made the decision right there. I said, either I'm going to really look at this and see if I can make money doing this to make it so I feel good about it, or just give up. And so I ended up kind of looking at the next year, tracking those numbers to say, how much time did I really spend in the carrot field? How much time did I really spend in the, the corn field or the, the turnip field? And wrote it down. And it, it's not hard, and it doesn't even take that much time. But just writing down these key pieces of information allowed me at the end of the year to say, wow, some things were spending a lot of time and not making much money and vice versa. And it ended up, I ended up taking a very um, timely, this holistic management course came up and this guy for three days kind of walked us through everything and it was a reason for me to sit down and I ended up crunching numbers and took 42 different crops that I was growing and I listed them in profitability, not the size, not you know five acres versus a tenth of an acre. I just said, okay, in terms of profitability, which are the best? And so, you know, I rated them in profitability, and I just drew a line and said, okay, I'm not going to draw. I'm not going to grow the last 20. I'm just going to, you know, this is dumb. You know, some were losing money, but some were just barely making money. So stop doing it. And you know, that following year, you know, from your casual observation on the outside you'd say well Richard's still running around with crew growing a bunch of different vegetables but my net income rose dramatically because I wasn't being dragged down by these kind of you know loss um, crops or marginally profitable crops and I was just focusing on the good ones and so nothing really changed on the outside except for what I was internally recognizing as um, the work to do and I would challenge any of your podcast listeners to, you know, if I were to say, you know, you could make $10,000 in three days, you'd be a fool not to do it. And all I want you to do is sit down and really think about your business, you know, take time to work on your business, not just work in your business and see, you know, what are the things that are making money and what are not. And when you do that, it's just like a light bulb goes on and you're like, I get it. And all of a sudden, these things are making money at the current price point, and I'll be able to net what you know maybe forty, fifty, eighty thousand dollars a year by doing this, depending on what your gross sales are, and feel very happy about it. And that was a revelation to me. I'm curious if you'd tell us what some of the winners and losers were. Like, were there any surprises in that list that you thought this one's definitely making money, mo- making me money? But then when you actually looked at the numbers, it kind of was the opposite. What, what surprised me was that the market hype really influenced my decision to grow things. So markets were screaming, oh, we need more broccoli. Oh, we, we'll take as much sweet corn as you can grow. I said, great, you know, this is huge. Well, because it's a delicate balance between capturing sales dollars into your checking account, right? You need to be able to sell something and get money for it, and then extract a net profit from that, right? So you, you you have to go out there and sell product, but you want to sell product that is making you money as well. So the certain other things were like, let's just take peppers or kale, which we didn't sell a lot of, but when I crunched the numbers, they were like at the top of the profitability list, and it kind of makes sense because they, you know, you once you plant them, they're just growing and um whether they're not on mulch or not, you know, they, it's just picking labor really to pick the, you know, you're making a lot of money just from picking and doing nothing else. And then certain things like lettuce, which, you know, is kind of the glamorous market gardening um, crop that everybody says, oh, I just love growing lettuce. 
is not that profitable. It's okay, but it's not, you know, especially head lettuce because, you know, you're you're transplanting it. You, you're growing it from seedlings. You're transplanting it. You're um, hoeing it. You might have some bottom rot, and you're only getting 70% cut. So all those kind of things contribute to the least profitability. And then there are certain things like sweet corn, which, again, has huge market demand, that I started saying, boy, even just a gross, you know, uh, $1,500 an acre is tough, whereas, you know, with lettuce you can gross 20000 well, depending on how you do it, but um, or salad mix, all those kind of things, you can gross quite a high number on per acre basis. But when you're, when you're if you don't have, if you can't garner the high gross, it's really hard to garner a high net from it. And with sweet corn, you can do it at scale, if people I know do that, and um, but again, it's you're not going to, it's not going to be as lucrative as other um, crops, even on a small scale. And like, you, you don't have to grow a lot of it. You, you could take a tenth of an acre of 10 crops, right, that are highly profitable and put together an acre of very profitable crops and do fine. You can net your 30,000 or whatever you need to net from that acre if you're smart about it. Whereas if you were to grow an acre of sweet corn, you're not going to make, you're going to be working outside, you know, during the winter uh, or working an off-farm job. And I don't like to beat up on sweet corn because I like it, but it just seems like the economics aren't there and yet the demand is really high. Yeah. No, sweet corn's a funny one. I mean, it's one that we grow a little bit of every year and we sell a little bit extra, but there's our, and our customers always wonder why we don't sell more. And that's when that's always the hard thing is explaining like we just can't make money on it. Well, that I did that too. So this year, many many years ago, when I just stopped growing twenty different of the twenty of the forty different crops, people at market and CSA, CSA would say, you know, how come you're not growing sweet corn or peas or um, beans? And I said, well, we had a really hard time making money at them, and we encourage you to go shop at you know the other market stalls or other CSAs, and you know buy locally if you can for those things. But we just can't make money at it, and we need to focus on what we're doing. And they said, okay, fine. And everybody's happy. We still have plenty to offer at CSA and the farmers market. Um, and you know, sweet corn. What's you know the the most efficient way would be to doing it would be waiting till the soil warms, direct sowing it. Um, on a stale seed bed, cultivating it, hopefully very minimally, and then just have most of your time spent picking it, right? But now, because there's people clamoring for it earlier and earlier, you know, we're starting from seed, we're transplanting, we're putting it into IRT mulch, we're, you know, spraying it, we're stringing it up with, uh, to keep the crows out of it, and we're spending a lot more inputs for not that much more money. And Maybe you found this, and other people have talked to me about saying, "Well, I need to have sweet corn at my farmer's market stand because even though it's not making that much money or maybe even losing money, it's a loss leader that gets people to my stand and i and I really have to question that and i I don't agree at all with that the mentality, the loss leader where you bring in people into your stand. If you bring asparagus in to bring people to your stand and it sells out fifteen minutes after market opens, all you're doing is losing money. And if I were to give you an analogy of, you know, me being on a, in a canoe, right, with, with a paddle on one shore and trying to get to the other shore, and I say I start out paddling and I take one hand, I have a paddle. The other hand, I've got a, a portable drill with a drill bit in it. And every time I paddle, I take the other hand, I drill a hole in the bottom of the canoe. And then I take another paddle and I drill another hole in the bottom of the canoe. And I keep doing this across the lake, you know. Eventually, I'm just going to sink or not get anywhere. But if, it seems pretty obvious that you just drop the drill and just put both hands on the paddle. You'll do much better. Better, And that's where if you stop losing money, you're going to do – if you stop doing things that lose money, you're going to do so much better. And if you want to grow things that lose money, I can't help you. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're going to lose money. I guess you're going to realize your dream of losing money. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was funny. Cause you brought, it's funny. You brought up the loss leader like that because I I've, I've heard that term and I've seen people kind of throw it around a little bit. I mean, just based on what you said, I don't, it doesn't sound like you, and we don't, but I, it doesn't sound like you do any loss leaders. Um, no, in fact, I'm dead against loss leaders. Again, when you're intentionally trying to lose, if you know, if you're knowingly losing money, 
you're just dragging it down. It'd be better not to do that. It might be something that you might want to have something marginally profitable that you know you're, at least you're on the in the black with to do at the market is that. But you know, and again, a challenge. The whole thing about saying, well, I have to go to farmers market with complete diversity, just to give you a, the total opposite of that is that. Um, after 2001, during after 9/11, um, my crew chief of eight years um, was pregnant and said, "You know, I'm not going to be able to work next year." And I said, "Huh? Well, let's rethink this." And we ended up saying, "Okay, well, let's take a kind of semi-sabbatical where we'll still be in business, but we're just going to grow one crop instead of you know the 20 that we bring to farmers market, and that crop happened to be greenhouse tomatoes." And it's a risk. We didn't know if this was going to work, but it worked out great. We just brought three tables full of tomatoes, and that's it. And people came to us for tomatoes. I happen to think they were pretty good tasting tomatoes. But people would keep, you know, just come to our farm stand for tomatoes and get their lettuce and corn and beans, everything else elsewhere, and that worked out fine. And and it really challenged the paradigm of saying you have to have everything all the time. And we kept doing that for years. And then, you know, my uncontrollable desire to grow things took the best of me, so I started filtering and other things and back into market. But the model of just being able to sell one thing that is very profitable and nothing else is a great model. And, you know, other people sold tomatoes too, but we it didn't impact our sales negatively by not having lettuce and not having bunch of beets and not having basil bunches. Right, and in some ways it's, uh, it's like one of those things where – you feel like if everybody's on that same path, we're all just going to be growing the exact same things. But I don't, and it does happen to an extent, but I do see a lot of diversity at the market. Like you find crops that you're good at, that you've figured out a good system for, and that you find profitability in that maybe somebody else hasn't. I think of carrots, like carrots could be profitable for some and not profitable for others because you're dealing with, you know, if you're hand weeding your carrots every week or whatever, that's, that's, you know, that's going to greatly impact your, your, uh, you know, your profitability there. But I think most people don't know if they're losing money on carrots or not. They don't realize how much money they are spending, but they're growing carrots. You could be a very efficient carrot grower, um, but there could be somebody less efficient growing them and, and undercutting you just because they want to get rid of their, their un, to be able to sell their carrots. I think, as I said earlier, that it's really good if you have an idea of where you're going to sell something before you even plant the seed. And so it doesn't do anybody any good if you or I plant an acre of red leaf lettuce to come in June. If we don't have an idea where the market is, all that's going to happen is we're going to come in and we're going to start undercutting our friends and neighbors trying to sell this crop that looks so beautiful but we have no market for, and we're going to upset the people that have been growing it or that, you know, had traditional markets and it's a race to the bottom. We're just going to say, okay, you undercut me and undercut you. And all of a sudden we're all losing money. And in effect, it would have been best just to disc in that acre of red leaf if you don't have a market for it. But again, if you do your homework and I guess anybody starting out or looking for new markets, I always recommend, you know, go and knock on the back of the door, not on a Monday, but maybe a Tuesday mid morning or something like that and talking to the produce manager chef and asking him, he said, you buying carrots or red leaf anywhere else? And they say, yeah, I'm getting it from Jesse. And said, okay, fine. But how about broccoli? And he said, oh yeah, no, we're not getting broccoli. How about that? And you start this relationship with this buyer, potential buyer and without stepping on other people's toes and, you know, kind of build from there. And so you make a handshake agreement, you come back, you know, you know, a, a month later and say, hey, remember our talk, I'm still growing red leaf for June, I'd love to sell it to you, I'll bring in a case next week, and then you bring in a case and show it to the chef or the produce buyer, and they say, wow, it looks great, and you go, and this is a very important part of the whole marketing process. Once that buyer says, sure, I'll take it, you have an invoice ready, you write the invoice, they sign it, whether they pay you or, or on the spot or not, it doesn't matter, you have a signed invoice, you have just started a relationship that hopefully they will continue for the rest of your life as long as you don't screw up and you maintain a good relationship. And marketing is such a relationship quality to it of working with a customer. So if they're short on something, you go out of your way to bring it in off schedule or, you know, on a Sunday or 
you know, they need a favor, you give it to them. Or if you need a favor, they will give it to you. And that works out well for both. And again, I'm a firm believer in cooperative um, associations as well as fair mindedness where, you know, we all are in this to make money. No market is going to have a supplier if the suppliers can't make money and no supplier is going to have a market if they can't make money. So there's a, you know, a sweet spot in there where the customer can still buy a head of lettuce for $3 or whatever the going rate is without the grower suffering or the marketer suffering their markup. Yeah, that's great. And I like that you touched on um, market research there for a second, because I feel like that's not something that people talk about, you know, just this idea of like, how do you even know, what the market is or what it looks like. Do you have any other thoughts on, you know, uh, how someone who's just starting a business or just moving into a new market can sort of investigate that and figure out what, uh, whether or not they need to be doing a farmer's market, a CSA, you know, wholesale, what, how, what does that look like? Like, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, starting a business is incredibly exciting and incredibly daunting at the same time. <laughs> and so when you, um, Looking at markets, I guess if you're new to an area or just starting a farm in the area that you know, you would survey the possible markets that are available to you. They could be wholesale accounts like a co-op. They could be a restaurant. They could be a farm stand. could be a farmer's market. could be a CSA. could be online sales, any number of things. And once you survey that, you have to say, okay, what markets are available and start that relationship. But also you have to look at what you want to grow and what you can grow that you think you can make money at, and also what your land is suited for. So there's a lot of moving parts there. But given, you know, if you have some adequate agricultural land and some skills to grow most anything, then it's a matter of just finding those markets and working with these potential buyers in a professional way of, you know, presenting yourself as a capable grower that's going to make their lives easier. If, why do they want to, why would a co-op produce buyer want to buy from you over who they've been getting it from or somebody else? And maybe they're getting it from California or some no name distributor, but it's, you know, you have to give them reason to either better service, better product or better price or all three. But you want to build it as a win-win relationship where both parties are going to be able to mutually benefit from this. And if you can do that and with them on board, everybody wins. And, you know, that some markets work and some don't. You could take a shotgun approach and sell to 20 different accounts and then realize that some don't really care about local or organic or some people don't pay for 90 days or some people you know, leave it on the shelf longer than you want to see it on the shelf, you drop those accounts, but you maybe then keep 10 good ones or five good ones that will then you work with. And I've had, I've been talking to some people for 38 years, the same people in produce world. And that's a good thing in a, in a sense. And restaurants tend to change hands more often, but you still have a track record and eventually you'll have a kind of a name where people say, yeah, you can count on the quality of XYZ farm. Hey, you all just jumping in real quick to get a word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by farmers web. Farmers web software gives you the tools you need to manage your entire sales process built specifically for farmers needs. Farmers web helps you to save time, reduce errors, increase efficiency, and provides flexibility for working seamlessly with your whole customer base. Visit farmersweb.com to schedule a demo, try their free account or a one month free trial of their paid accounts. And don't forget to check out their free how to guides on selling online to individual buyers, as well as how to work with such buyers as restaurants, schools, and stores at www.farmersweb.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are designed and built in Italy, where small-scale farming has been a way of life for generations. Discover the beauty of BCS on your farm with PTO-driven implements for soil working, shredding cover crop, spreading compost, mowing under fences, clearing snow, and more. All powered by a single gear-driven machine that's tailored to the size and scale of your operation. To learn more, view sale pricing, or locate your nearest dealer, visit bcsamerica.com. That's bcsamerica.com. All right, back to the show. 
Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, and in fact, some of our Patreon members were interested in as well, is, you know, especially for those of us trying different sort of no-till and reduced tillage methods, um, maybe that some of them are high input, like adding, you know, deep compost uh, mulches. Um, Some of them, you know, may cool the soil a lot and maybe slow down growth or those sorts of things. So I'm just curious, like, if we're trying to figure out financially if something like that is, is, is making us money, you know, a new method, how do we go about that? Like, what do you, what's, what are the steps to figuring out, like, if we're trying a new no-till method or trying several different methods, what are the steps to figuring out if that's profitable? What you're talking about doing is making a, either a crop budget or a crop budget comparison to see if something is profitable or not, or more profitable or not. And that is essential to knowing where the money comes and goes in your business. And I can't overemphasize the need to be able to do that. And you want to do that on a few of your crops to see if you're making money on them. And I would probably start, if you're already growing, on the biggest sales item because that's going to have the biggest effect on your checkbook to see if you're growing a lot of carrots, are they making money or not? It makes no sense if you're only growing 20 feet of radishes to do a crop budget on that first. I'd do the bigger numbers first. And you can do this pretty simply. Of course, you know, I'm kind of known as a, you know, record-keeping geek. And truth be told, I don't like keeping records any more than anybody else. But I do it out of necessity and to achieve a larger goal of being able to uh, make a good living on farming and, and having a balanced life. The idea would be to keep track of as few numbers as you possibly can to determine your end goal and to keep your eye on the correct moving object to which is going to be whether it's profit, this crop is profitable or not. And I'll give you some just starter tips. Is One thing is to, to, on the back of an envelope, just kind of sketch out the biggest concerns that you have. So you'd sketch out, or here's another way. Imagine you have 100 foot of bed feet. Okay, so I'm going to say that's a six foot aisle to aisle with a four foot bed in between, 100 feet long, okay? That 100 feet could be planted to anything you want. You could put sweet corn, you could put salad mix, you could do carrots, whatever. So you're trying to determine what's the best use for this or if you're determining if a new crop would pay. And since it's already fertilized and since it's already tilled and ready to go, you're kind of stripping out of all these other factors like overhead costs and marketing costs. All you're trying to do is figure out if the production costs are going to pay for, or the the sales price is going to pay for the production costs with enough margin so you have a lot of um, extra to pay for overhead and marketing costs and land prep. It turns out that land prep usually is not a big cost in a, in a crop budget. The biggest cost in a crop budget are usually labor associated with um, hand cultivation and as well as hand harvesting and pack out. Those are where the biggest bang for your buck in terms of you know efficiency are. You know, getting the land up into fertilization or even you know um, ready to till is not that big a player generally. So if you have this blank hundred foot bed, the first thing I would do is I just say, what are the gross sales that I think I can get from carrots or turnips? And I can look up any number of places for yield for that, and I can get a sense, okay, I'm going to get um, 500 pounds at a dollar a pound. That's $500. Great. Then you figure out where your costs are going to be. And I usually do this just on a, and you can do this on an envelope to make it, I want you to keep it simple, or your listeners to keep it as simple as possible, to just do it in chronological order, and you can do a projected budget. You don't have to do it in real time. You can just say, okay, if I were to spend, you know, 15 minutes seeding my carrots, and then waiting two weeks and then coming out and watering it or row covering it and figuring, okay, well, I think I can probably row cover that in about 40 minutes. Then, you know, uncover it and then weed it with, with a hoe or whatever method you have and then wait again and then come back in July and maybe do a final hand weed and then in August you're starting to harvest and then you just you harvest the whole bed and you figure out, you get your 500 pounds and 
you, you can total up your expenses pretty quickly. I call these like quick budgets because you're kind of just comparing this unit of 100 bed feet to see which pays and which one doesn't. It doesn't account for the overhead and marketing costs, granted, but at least you get side-by-side -side comparisons, which is a lot of what you want to do. It's just comparing, comparing the production costs or the variable costs. And maybe uh, I should explain variable and um, fixed costs. So variable costs are things that go up and down with the level of production. So if you plant two beds of carrots, you're going to buy twice as many seeds, twice as much row cover, twice as much fertilizer, twice as many bags to put them in. Fixed costs are your telephone and your insurance and your internet um, hookup. All that doesn't matter if I call up the seed company and order twice as many seeds, my phone doesn't go up. You know, those are like, I don't like the term fixed because nothing's really fixed, but those are fixed costs that won't change. And so those you're just going to pay for after all the crops are done and sold. And just as a side, footnote, nofavt.org has some great work on cost of production, um, lots of information, lots of easy to read takeaways about cost, how to do budgets and how to do cost of production stuff. Anyway, you can just check it out online. The, the end of it all will just be your sales minus all your chronological expenses. And when you're doing any kind of budget, whether it's 100 bed feet or a quarter acre, half acre, you all, there's two things you need to set, first of all, is the size of the unit, which is 100 bed feet or a quarter acre, and the labor hour, that, the average labor hour that you're using. So say $15 an hour is what you're paying people. You just say $15 an hour. So if I spent four hours weeding, it's $60. And then you translate your hourly inputs into dollar, and you can take your sales dollars of $500 minus the $300 of um labor and seed uh, that you put in there, and boom, then you have a, a rough idea of if that made money or not. Certain things you're going to find that, uh, I, okay, of the 40 different crops that you can grow, you know, I can guarantee you that they're not going to be the same profitability. There's going to be a pretty wide range in profitability, and it's all unique depending on your situation, about your markets and your ability and your land and everything else, but I can guarantee you that they're not going to be profitable. So given that, if you, it is really important to separate which ones are making money and which ones aren't making as much money or even losing money. And it's not hard to do. It doesn't take that much time, and I would encourage everyone, especially in the off-season, to try to do a projected budget where you're taking a unit area, a assigned labor rate, and expected yield for this unit area with a dollar value on what it is so you know what the potential gross sales are and then figure out what the expenses are. And it, to, to do this, you can you know, get lost in the muck sometimes trying to figure out you know, what the cost of electricity is to run the water pump. And it's like, don't worry about that. Just carve out the easy numbers first carve out the big numbers first. Those little numbers are not going to matter that much if you're spending um, $4 on some micronutrients that you put down. So don't worry about it. You know, Maybe put a bookmark or an asterisk there. But generally, you can figure out pretty quickly which ones are doing well and which ones aren't. And the other thing, it's an incredibly enlightening experience. And this is not just coming from a budget-making geek, but you start understanding where the money comes and goes and you start realizing where money can be saved. Like, oh, you know, a flame weeder would actually really be effective in growing parsnips and carrots. It doesn't cost that much. It would pay itself off in a year, and then I can sell it if I needed to sell the flame weeder. You start thinking that way. Or, oh, I, you know, a barrel washer for $2,500, that would make a lot of sense. The other thing I recommend besides these simple crop budgets are to do um, another tool that I'm a big fan of are cost benefit analysis, which are just a simple analysis of whether buying a barrel washer or a bed lifter or a flame leader makes sense. And all you're doing is just doing it the way you're doing it now and then doing it the way with this new tool is. And you just do side by side columns to see 
when it would pay off or how much money you'd save, especially if you scale up. I, I wanted to just remark on this idea of like the projected budget and not having it be absolutely perfect and have every number involved right away. Because I think one of the, where the paralysis often comes from, at least for me, or it has in the past, and it's uh, slowly going away, is this idea that it has to be kind of perfect right from the get-go and that I have to have all the numbers right in front of me and that I have to, you know, have time to myself cultivating the carrots so I know exactly, you know, those sorts of, those sorts of things you start thinking about each and every unit and then it just ends up, you know, keeping you from, from just going forward and making some educated guesses or even just walking out to the field and being like, okay, I'm pretending to cultivate the carrots. How long is this going to take me? Or whatever it would be or seeding the carrots or whatever. So I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. So basically when people sometimes read the book or go to a talk um, on budget keeping, they go home and say, great, I'm going to start keeping records just like Richard said, and I'm going to track everything that everybody does 24 seven, 365 days a year. And they get a pile of numbers at the end of the year and they look at it and they throw their arms up in frustration and stop the whole process and not this is not the intended result so again i want to make people do it as simply as possible and there's a couple of tricks to do this is one of them is to focus focus on rates and that means two or three variables that means like weeding bed feet per hour or um bushels per bed foot you know, it could be two two variables or three. It's not saying April 15th seeded beets. That's it's kind of useful, but it doesn't really tell me anything. If I say April 15th spent 15 minutes seeding an ounce of beets, that's important information. So these ratios you can use forever. Once you double check your um, your ratios, then you don't need to do it again. You can just stop taking information. If you're growing salad mix, okay, you're going to seed salad mix in a 100-foot bed. Unless you start jogging, pushing the seeder, it's going to be the same amount of time every single time you do it. And the same with washing and bagging. You're pretty much going to be the same amount of time bagging for, you know, washing and packing in salad mix as well as probably picking. So once you do a, a trial of saying you take two or three samples of how long it takes you to harvest or seed, stop taking information. So if you were to grow salad mix 20 different times in the growing season, you don't need to track every single time you seed, you cut, and you wash and pack. That's just like over-information. Don't do it. Just figure out how much it is to pick you know, or to seed, weed, pick, and wash and pack. And that's done. And then you can do a really good budget. And that budget in itself will be very valuable. So when – and again – I don't care which is in the seed hopper. You're still pushing a seeder. It's gonna if you're doing three rows to a bed. It's gonna take you the same amount of time. And if you're um, any covering remake, it doesn't really matter what's under it. It's still gonna be the same amount of time. So all you need to do is figure out some key things that are done repeatedly and use those ratios. And you just have a sheet. When you and that's why I think, you know. Even if you're to spend, if your listeners are to spend 15 minutes right after this podcast and write down on a pad of paper a projected budget, they're going to realize what information is missing, and then they can post those rates on their pack house door and say, we need to know how long it takes to transplant 100 feet of lettuce. And once you do that, it, you do it twice, you say, 45 minutes, wow, and done. Then you can make a budget and say it takes, you know, put a dollar value on that, and you're really off to the races. Again, it doesn't take a lot of time, but it does take better having a watch or a smartphone, a watch and a piece of paper and a pen, or a smartphone to do that. Another thing you can check into is a, a phone app called Beat Clock, B E E T Clock, and that is a record keeping system for the phone where you can just you know, track on your phone or input on your phone all these different things when you're weeding, picking beans versus weeding carrots versus trellising tomatoes. And it, then it can even populate a spreadsheet for a budget. And I'm not, I don't have any financial connection. I helped the guy develop it, but I have no interest, financial interest in it. But I think it's a smart uh, app that you can use as farmers. It costs like four bucks. Yeah, that's great. That's not one I, I was aware of. So, yeah, so... The key is to keep it simple 
And the key is to why are you doing this? I mean, the, the why are you doing this is so you can make more money in less time. And one thing you and I and all your listeners have in common is that we all share 24 hours a day. That's all we have. And some of that's for sleep and some of that's for eating and some of that's for family time. The point is that we only have a limited amount of time to work and use those hours wisely. You know, don't, you know, you want to be using those hours at our work time to be effective in putting money in the bank. Don't leave it to hope and hard work to make your farm succeed. You can, you might get lucky, but generally it's much better to, you know, farm smarter, not harder by, again, working on your business, not, I mean, working on your business, not just in your business, and to spend some time, you know, looking at seeing how those inner workings of your business actually make you money and not. You know, I think another thing that I, I, I work with farmers, you know, not so much during the pandemic, but, you know, over the years I've been doing business planning with farmers through different programs, and it's very rewardable to see folks kind of, you know, take the ball and run with it and become very successful people, very successful. And some of the things that, um, you know, I recommend to these folks are things, just spend three minutes to write down what your job likes and what your job dislikes are, and say, okay, I I really like growing things. I really dislike collecting money. I really dislike firing people. I really, or even dealing with people. I hate marketing, whatever it is. But, you know, once you write it down, then you can say, okay, well, let's focus on what I like and not focus on what I dislike or hire it out to somebody else. That it really helps, you know, you crystallize, you know, your business desire too. You know, business is a, a living, breathing, not breathing, but living thing where, you know, you need to pay attention to it. Yeah, right. And the living, I, I've thought about this idea of like a living farm for a long time. Just this, it's it's got its own needs and it's, but it's also changing and growing and being refined. And it's not always the same necessarily year to year. The markets change, uh, you know, they're, they're big upheavals and, and changes in the market like pandemics, but there's also small ones as more growers get into the market, there's more competition. Um, it's got to be treated like a living thing. Right. And dynamic in terms of it's not, you think, oh, I've got it all done now. And then a curveball whacks me upside the head that I didn't see coming 40 years of doing this. You know, this still happens. <laughs> That's pretty discouraging to people starting out, but uh, they're not, they're not, I, I still get up uh, off the ground, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but curveballs will continue to happen. And that's just part of the, the nature of life. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about earlier, we were, you were talking about, you know, stopping and taking the notes. And I think for myself, it's always been like note taking hasn't, or not necessarily note taking, but taking, following, uh, you know, keeping track of things, keeping track of budgets and those sorts of things. And just taking a minute to make sure that the things that I'm doing are make sense and make money, um, has often felt one, not that romantic. I mean, there's that whole side of it. There's that whole stigma to it. Um, but two, it hasn't felt like action. Like, if I have the choice between going out and planting lettuce or sitting down with a pen and, pa and you know piece of paper and seeing if lettuce is making me money, I'm probably just going to go in my head, just go plant the lettuce because I know that it's going to have a return on it. But like, it doesn't always feel that way with writing something down. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. But I also know planting lettuce is in a sense easier, maybe emotionally than actually saying, is lettuce making me money, and am I going to really jeopardize my whole view of life? Because if I find out that lettuce is not making money, that I'm worthless, and I've just made a colossal mistake in doing what I'm doing, that's a pretty heavy thing to risk looking at. And so I'm just going to keep my blinders on. I'm just going to go out there and plant my lettuce and pretend nothing's going on. I, I I mean, that's exactly how I felt. I don't know if other people feel the same way, but it was a, a huge risk of saying, you know, I'm questioning my entire existence here by analyzing this. And if it doesn't make money, you know, I, it's, a, it's a big realization that's not going to be a lot of fun. And so I encourage people to, you know, do what you're saying. It's like, you know, it's not, it's not fun and it's work. And that's why I say, if you're grossing a hundred thousand dollars, 
you could probably make $10,000 in a couple of days by squeezing more efficiency out of your operation. You know, it's, I can't guarantee that, but I could probably say you, you do safely and you might make a lot more just by figuring out, you know, where your money's coming and going. And if you have that kind of motivation, not to say we're all just a bunch of capitalists chasing the dollar, but, you know, farming is like we're not we're not driving, you know, Ferraris around. You know, we would still need to make a money, and I think profit gets a bad word because of all the stuff that goes on with Wall Street and elsewhere. But we just have to make, you know, we have to make a living. We want to make a fair living. We want to be able to pay our employees well and, you know, have a fair price for the customers. You know, that's that's a good thing. And as small businesses, we're an incredibly powerful tool to implement change that you know, by the way we spend money and the services that we um, provide and um, and use dictate how the world is going to be. So I'm a big fan of having your business succeed and be a positive force. And by the more you sharpen your pencil, the more you can pay yourself, you can pay your employees, you can make food affordable or give money to food banks – or get product or food banks, any of those kind of things, it's a really positive thing. It's not fun to do, but it does pay to do it. And I, I, I'm not sure, else, maybe you could hire somebody else to do it. But again, keep it simple. Don't spend too much time. Take as few numbers as possible. Just try it. Try one or two budgets. If you do one or two or three budgets, you're going to find out that the rest are just going to fall in line in no time at all because you've already kind of done, you know, I know how much remake covers go on and off cost or seating a 100-foot row. Any of that kind of stuff is just going to be second nature to you. Yeah. I So I, I'm going to change subjects here real quick because I've maybe got 10 or so minutes we left with you. Um, but I, you know, I have to, I'd be remiss if we didn't get some, some, soil practices in here. Um, because especially coming from somebody who's, you know, looks at this, uh, through that lens, I'm curious, cause you know, you'd mentioned to me before that you do some no tillage in your greenhouses and I'm kind of interested to hear what that looks like. And also sort of how that came about and why you decided in the greenhouses. Cause that's often, that was how we started too. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to hear a little bit about that. I guess you'd have to define no till. Like, is that no till mean like no rake, no shovel, or does that mean no rototiller, or does that you know? So if you're to say um, no rake, no shovel, no or no rototiller, I'm not that. And I do understand the beauty of the system of preserving soil with that with minimal disturbance so you keep the the richness of the micro mycorrhizal associations and biota in the soil in place without disturbing them and that every time you're running a cultivator through your you know throwing oxygen in there and depleting carbon you're doing some damage in doing all those field tasks so in the greenhouse because it's a small space, we can use weed mats and grow our tomatoes and, you know, with a weed mat down and, you know, we fertilize ahead of time, work in compost rock minerals, lay the drifts, put a weed mat down, and then pretty much do nothing except trellis and pick tomatoes after that. Then we roll up after the tomatoes this time of year, we pull all the tomatoes, compost them, sweep off the weed mat, roll it up, and then um, re-put compost down and then comes next spring if it's going to be greens we seed greens but we will take a light tilling or a hand rake or something to to kind of make a bed or however you want to say it prep so- the soil before the next crop so it's not no-till it's not like lifting off a tarp and just planting in it and then putting the tarp back on and, and doing that repeatedly you know, I know you do a plant sale in the spring and I was curious what sort of went into making that decision in terms of your profitability and in terms of like, 
you know, just how you design that system. Because my wife and I are looking at doing, we're, you know, we're going to maybe open a little farm store. We've got a building that we're tur- slowly turning into a farm store. Um, we'd like to do plant starts from our farm store. And we're kind of looking at like how to even get go about it. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, our plant sales evolved. I mean, we've always grown transplants for our own field production. And when we were doing 16 acres of row crops, we were growing a lot of bedding or a lot of plants, you know, in, in plug trays or um, four pack, six pack kind of thing to put in the field. And we realized that, well, we're not that far away from just, you know, taking those same six packs and putting them on a shelf somewhere. And so I started selling them um, wholesale to a local co-op in a very small scale on consignment. And that seemed to work. And we kind of grew the business from there. In terms of, that's how it kind of originated because we were already in the business of growing plants, but we were just doing it on a farm scale. So then we were just doing this as a surplus kind of thing. And then we realized, I think one year we just had more plants that we had grown or we had changed crop mixes or something. And so we said, okay, well, what, do we, what should we do with these? And instead of just selling them wholesale, we ended up saying, okay, we'll be open one day a week, one Saturday, and just have people come in. And it turns out if enough people showed up and we kind of built up the business from there. The... Um, the, it was more of a sales avenue that we were pursuing, which was new, which was capturing sales dollars into our bank account that weren't, there's like a new marketing pie, rather, and that we're bringing more money to the bank. And that was, that was nice. In order, in terms of if it was profitable or not, it took us years to figure that out because it's a, um, in my book, it actually, says, unfortunately, my book has got some kind of mind-numbingly complicated budgets in there, but I had to be transparent to the reader, so I had to really pack it with information, and I apologize to the reader for that. <laughs> but if you read the fine print, there's a lot of good information in there. Um, but it talks about like how much it costs to raise a, um, a six-pack in different shapes or sizes or a three-and-a-half-inch pot or whatever else, the cost of doing that. And you know, certain things are, you know, easier to make money on where they're, say, they're direct seeded and quickly germinated, say, sweet peas or cosmos or something like that, as opposed to pansies, which we start in January under lights for two months, and then we move them into the greenhouse, we pot them up three times, put them in a pack, and we sell them for the same price. And there's so much more cost in there. You know, we we grow pansies because we're still making money, but we're not making nearly as much money as the things that are direct seeded or things that are direct seeded without any, obviously, the lights, but also later on in the season that don't even take any heat. Things like um, if we're direct seed, uh, winter squash, uh, cucumbers kind of thing, because you know, you're know you not going to put them in your garden until, at least up here, until late May. So you're not starting them until May 1st, and you hardly need any heat in the greenhouse anyway. So those are the things that tend to make more money just because you're getting the same value as that pansy, which has been – I'm beating up on pansies, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, they've been, you know, it's true. They've been, they've been, we've been caring for them since January. And a lot of people buy plugs you know, of pansies, and they don't do that. But we grow everything from seed. We don't buy anything and resell it. So we're all – we start everything from seed here on the farm – organic potting mix. And so we tend to be a little bit more uh, handcuffed by not buying in other things. Whereas other, you know, you could, if you decided, hey, I don't want to heat a greenhouse, I'm just going to buy pansies and March 15th, you have a a different um, budget than we do. We also bought a soil block. We bought a used soil blocker from the Netherlands last year because I want to really move away from poly and the whole greenhouse business is so saturated with poly it makes you know i love poly i hate poly it works great but it just is gross and so every six pack that leaves the farm usually goes to the landfill i really don't want to stop that in my lifetime i want to see no plastic in the greenhouse and we bought a soil blocker to do that built a bunch of wood trays so now we can stamp out five thousand blocks an hour and have them seeded. The trouble with soil blocks is harder to transplant into, but you know, for the direct seeded crops, and we have different size blocks that we can make with the machine. That, you know, that's the wave for me um, to see a greenhouse full of wooden 
benches with wooden flats with soil blocks in it with really healthy plants and selling them to the consumer that put them into cardboard soda flats or something like that without ever seeing a piece of poly. You know, it's a challenge because customers don't want to pick up dirt that crumbles. You know, that's why, you know, these six packs have evolved for a reason. You go to, you know, I've seen pictures, I got to go to Europe, but I've seen pictures in Europe where, you know, these soil blockers, which have been around for a while, customers are used to it and that's how they sell things. They sell them in little um, berry fiber packs or they sell them in taco trays, kind of paper um, shallow trays that, you know, you can just buy for the same four pack as you would in a poly and there's no poly at all and the plants are better anyway. So that's what we're trying to move towards. But in terms of profitability of different crops in the greenhouse, we still grow pansies and we still grow things that are customer demand. I feel like I'm being so hypocritical because I'm growing things that are less profitable than others, but people still want tomato plants, which need to get started, pricked out, and have a short shelf life because they get leggy. So we still grow them because there is a big demand. And we've been, you know, I've been doing this for long enough that it's a we've made a lot of mistakes over the year and i guess i should say i'm proud of those mistakes because i don't try to make them more than once but i've learned a lot that we now know how to do things and um know what the market needs so we're not throwing out a lot like in any farming venture you don't want to you want to minimize waste you want to be able to again plant every seed that you have a market for but not one more and that's never going to happen, but you try to aim for that market saturation without going too far over. I um I'm re- I was really interested there when you were talking about that so the soil blocks. Um, we do we do primarily soil blocks on our farm. Do you know what the brand of that soil blocker is? It's a D E W A a Dewa, which has now been bought by Demtech D E M T E C. And you can, you know, I paid, this is one in very good condition with a number of blocks, and I paid $5,000 delivered from the Netherlands. Mm. You can go to some websites in the Netherlands, or um, it's hard to find them in the U.S. I looked for a long time in the U.S., couldn't find them. And go right to the source where they make them, and you can find them. New ones are going to probably cost you 25 for this kind of production. But it's so slick, you know, by making them by hand, it gets old real fast. And by the volume that we have, we could never even think about doing that. Yeah. We may, well, hopefully there's an importer listening who will take the hint that we'll, we'll take some of those in the U S. But you know, I think there is, well, there's one in British Columbia, but, um, yeah. So, but right. Even if you have to order, you know, or you get a, maybe your podcast will stimulate a bunch of people to put in an order together and bring over a container. That's what we did with growers in Vermont, put a container together of different um, implements. And I can email you, I can't spell it, but I could email you the name of the company that we dealt with. So you can list it on your podcast if you want to do that. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Well, Richard Wiswall, this has been an excellent conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Well, happy to help there, Jesse, um, and good luck to all your listeners there. All right, if you enjoyed that episode and you do not already own a copy of Richard's book, I highly recommend that you remedy that issue immediately. Links in the show notes and at notillgrowers.com. Also, if you're so inclined, please pick up a copy of my book, The Living Soil Handbook. And when you do so from notillgrowers.com, the proceeds go to making more content like this. You would not believe the work and money that goes into creating shows like this and all the other resources we offer from videos to podcasts. So if you enjoy it and get something out of it, consider supporting it. This episode and all of our episodes this season are supported in part by a grant from Southern Sayre. You can learn more about our grant at our website, notillgrowers.com. Also, I am currently starting the conference season, and there is a lot of places you can find me. I post, posted that at the Patreon page and at our Instagram page, uh, but it includes the Acres Eco Ag Conference in December of 2021 in Cincinnati. If you use the discount code VIP10, that's capital VIP and the number 10, you can get a 10% discount on the standard ticket price. 
Make sure you are subscribed to this podcast wherever you are getting it and leave a review. But this week, all reviews must break down all of your favorite spreadsheet tips and tricks because I still feel like I could use some help in that area. Huge thanks as always to Jackson Roulette for making No Till Growers Run. Thanks to Josh Satin for his help. Thanks to Willie Breeding for the theme music. Hugest thank you in the history of thank yous to Hannah Crabtree for being amazing. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. I'm, I'm good to go. I fear it's going to be, you know, you asking or prompting and um, me spewing away for a while and then you <laughs> interjecting something else or seeing a direction that you'd like to go and then just having the conversation flow that way yeah that's that's pretty much podcasting in a nutshell right there